Okay, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for our first uh, seminar of the 2018-2019 academic, uh, academic year. We're going to try something new, which may not go well because you're not cut for it, but we're going to try it. So a few of us that have gone to the entomology seminars uh, fairly regularly appreciate the way they start their seminar, the weekly seminar, which is they ask anybody in the audience to introduce any new people that they might have with them. And so we thought we would try that. Does anyone in the audience know somebody new who is here that they would like to introduce? Students, visiting scientists, anyone? <laughs> Go ahead, Erin. I'll introduce Madison Kramer. She's a new graduate student in the Weed Science program. <laughs> She's earning with Travis, who's not here to Okay, welcome. And I think she's sitting in line with two other new students, correct? So, do uh, you all want to say hello briefly? Little Lisa D'Angelo, am I right? I believe. Of your advisor? Don't tell me you're not And then? Hi, I'm Chantal. Uh, I am a new student of the IPSS. My advisor is Dr. Bruce. That's right. And then Dan, new. How do you, Dan? I mean, so many of you didn't have you, though. He's been here since May and he's a new student with um, Kathleen. Who else have we got? Anyone else new? Okay, so we'll get better at this. <laughs> I'll ask every week for anybody who might be new. All right, the other announcement today is that um, you know we're going to start a little bit of um, food afterwards, just sort of light refreshments for those of us that would like to follow up with any kind of conversations that, um, that we have while we're all together. And I want to say Bob Pierce, who unfortunately is not here, um, because he's paying for it all. So he gave a gift to the university and will pay for our food for I think this whole semester and maybe half next. So thanks, Bob. Okay, today it is my pleasure to welcome Frank Sapora to our seminar series. Many of you know Frank, he's, um, he's been with our department for 20 years, I discovered, uh, to the year. He's been an adjunct associate professor with us since 1998. Um, Frank received his PhD from the University of Illinois and then a master's in agronomy, a PhD was in agronomy, and then a master's and PhD degrees in plant and soil sciences from the University of Tennessee for the master's and then West Virginia University for his PhD. Many of you know he's been very active in establishing methodologies and standards for a whole variety of, of soil tests, I would say primarily, many of which um, I deal with nutrients. He served in a number of national committees um, and editorial boards with the aim of um, improving uh, soil fertility measurements and reports. <clears throat> There um, aren't too many of us that end up with buffers named for us. <laughs> and I think Craig has too. The Sakura buffer and the more Sakura buffer, right? <laughs> so that's, that's pretty special right there. <laughs> He's also um, been very active in education, which is a little bit unusual, but I think his official title doesn't have much of an educational expectation. But luckily for us, uh, Frank taught an important class for our department, Plant and Soil Relationships, which was PLS 650, for 11 semesters. So, had a lot of students, my own included, that moved through there and learned a lot from him. He's also been an advisory on six master's students and two PhDs, I imagine, all for us, be my guess. Yep. And he's even advised some undergraduate students. So, with that, welcome. Okay, thank you, Beth. A little clarification on a more secure buffer. It wasn't more of the secure buffer. <laughs> it was in collaboration with a Kathy Moore at Clemson University. <laughs> so we named it after her last name and the final name. So it just so happens to sound like more of the score. You got the better end of that. So thank you uh, for the invite. Uh, to give uh, seminar presentation. Uh, 
when I was giving or preparing for this presentation, I was bringing back memories of preparing for PLS 650 and scrambling to get all the slides together the same day I was giving it. I'm, I'm thankful that the seminar time was pushed back a little bit. <laughs> to give me a little more time. Uh, when I was asked for a title, I gave Rebecca a very broad title uh, on laboratory functions and division regulatory services. Uh, as I'll show in a couple of slides from here, I narrowed that down quite a bit because I didn't want to give a broad uh, overview of what we do. I wanted to focus on, on some more details uh, that I think would be interesting to you all. A little timeline of myself. Uh, Rebecca indicated I started uh, working here in 1998. I came to TVA before coming here. I was at the National Fertilizer Environmental Research Center, which was previously the National Fertilizer Development Center for 10 years. Uh, came in 1998, and I was sole test coordinator in Division Regulatory Services up till 2012. In uh, 2012, we went on under my reorganization and my position changed quite a bit where I was uh, overseeing all of laboratory functions in rank services, not just the sole test. So these, this is a, a distribution of income that we receive in regulatory services uh, for the different commodities that we regulate. I show this to point out the fact that I am no longer I was no longer just in charge of soil. My responsibility had to deal with analysis of all these materials. Uh, so I gravitated you know, toward uh, my time being spent more with the fertilizer because that what brings in most of the money. The department. And the money is brought in through taxes, through the sale mm -hmm. of feed and fertilizer, uh, brings in money to regulatory services. Uh, seed regulatory uh, service, we also have a lab testing uh, seed. Uh, seed testing here is a service uh, that we offer for consumers that want their seed tested. Uh, soil is strictly service, we regulate milk. Being moved in tanker trucks, not the milk that you buy in the store. Uh, bulk milk is what we regulate. And I got two small slices of pie here being ag, lime, and hemp. Uh, two years ago, we started uh, uh, being a contract lab for Kentucky Department of Agriculture for sampling ag, lime, and doing the testing. So they're giving us uh, money to do that, and we provide reports on uh, left line quality on the website from our testing. <clears throat> in hemp, we started last year working with KDA and doing uh, hemp testing to make sure it's not marijuana. Uh, and I'll be talking a lot about that today. I want to. Uh, mention and point out the people that are involved in doing all this work, the regulatory services up front in my presentation. There's 28 individuals uh, that, that does a lot of work. And these uh, scientists, biologists, and chemists are very dedicated and they are, they really strive to do the best at what they do. And I just want to applaud and uh, point out their efforts and I'm glad to lead in at right service. When I was thinking about what to present, I started about a month ago. I didn't start actually preparing slides until a couple days ago. <laughs> but about a month ago, you know, I formulated my mind. Well, I, I came up with about five topics. <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, you know, I've started putting slides together and it's just too much. So the, the two topics I'm going to cover today are what's shown here. Uh, soil testing, I'm sure you are most interested in what we do with soils and the services we can offer you as a research community uh, in soil testing. So I'll, I'll cover that. Uh, 
discuss some future changes uh, with Princeton uh, renovation going on, where we have a soil test lab down there. And some interesting work on organic matter that uh, Jimmy has uh, contacted me about, and I've seen in the ag uh, econ publication on nitrogen recommendation based on organic matter. Uh, and then hemp. I'll, I'll talk about the hemp work we're doing. We're doing ADA. There's a lot of interesting chemistry with respect to that. So the soil testing. This gives an overview of the number of samples that go through the lab on a yearly basis. Uh, going way back to 1980 for total samples. Uh, when I came in 1998, I, the data was there and I just Started, I kept it and continued uh, accounting of the sample numbers. I thought it was kind of interesting. I, I've been looking at this downward trend in ag samples. These are ag samples, and it, this is both the Lexington and Princeton labs. I noticed this downward trend, and there was generally a downward trend also in ag samples from 1992. To 2000. When I came in 98, there was a lot of discussion about why this was occurring. Uh, I don't have an answer. I don't really even have a guess, but I just thought it was curious that it looks uh, some period periodicity to it. <laughs> that uh, maybe this is about the same length of time that this was a downtrend, and hopefully it will go up again. Home lawn guard samples really increase. It's hard to tell because the numbers are so low, but it's, it, they almost doubled uh, over a 10 year period. And then these are commercial horticulture samples. This is a summary of the tests we provide in both Lexington and Princeton laboratories. Uh, in the Lexington laboratory, we do a lot of different uh, type of tests on soil. In addition to the metallic three and pH, uh, we do all these optional tests. Uh, other media we test in soils by the Mexican are for animal waste uh, for determining nutrient content for land application. Uh, soilless media or greenhouse media, as it used to be called, uh, and water samples. The water we test for nutrient content for irrigation purposes and. Uh, uh, used for uh, greenhouse operations. In Princeton, uh, they test just the metallic three and pH. Currently, uh, oh, I went ahead of myself here. I'm just give you a, a little bit of numbers on the other media we test on a daily basis. Animal waste, we do about 300 a year. Uh, soilless media, about 100 and water 75. In the future, after the renovation of the lab in Princeton, you're going to add organic matter uh, in Princeton and plant tissue uh, analysis. This is the same graph as I showed earlier, but now I have research samples shown on there to point out how much research we do uh, in terms of samples coming to our lab for testing and analysis. And what, well, every one of our tests has a cost associated with it. We have a cost structure that's on the website. And it, this is what we charge producers that request the test and send samples to us. We bill the county extension offices. We don't bill our, uh, the farmer or homeowner directly. We bill the county extension office. We bill them each quarter. Uh, but at the same time that those bills go out, I also send out bills to the researchers submitting samples to us, not with a due amount, but with a, an amount to let the researchers know how much uh, it costs us uh, for the lab. So just, just an awareness type of thing. <clears throat> this is the yearly amount of cost uh, from doing those research samples. <clears throat> so you see it, it, it ranges from $100,000 to $150,000 a year on the number of samples we go, that goes through our lab 
that we would normally charge if we would charge. Just, I, I point this out just to mention that we are under increasing pressure to recover these costs. Yes, sir. Is that the cost of doing the samples or the lost revenue because you did it for free as opposed to $6 a sample or something? I'm not sure I understand. Oh, is that the full cost of doing? I mean, that's just the cost of doing the samples. That's the amount we would charge if, if, uh, we, would so it's, a, if, if we would put a, if we would put this cost on. Right, I got you. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's, it's it's revenue that you didn't get. That's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, I, this is tally, and it's 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 seen as uh, something we need to try to capture. Uh, we, we cannot charge on a per sample basis because we're not a cost center. Uh, but what we can do is uh, charge a research account uh, for supplies. So I, I'm asking, and this is not mandatory, but if you have a large number of samples that is, that is going through our laboratory, call me. Uh, we can negotiate a price based on how much samples you're submitting. You know, if they're already prepared, we'll probably negotiate a price that's not uh, the same as what a producer would be charged. And, you know, if you have grant money to, to pay for that, we can get the account number and then charge the grant. There's some researchers who have done it, they're really appreciative about that. And uh, this is just a commercial to try to refer to that. <laughs> To, to get that uh, skill <laughs> into the thought process. Okay. Uh, something that may be of interest to you as a researcher that we have, and what I'm going to present here, you don't have to pay for. So <laughs> this is just coming from a commercial saying we need money, but this is this is available, but it's it's not a cost to us. So. I, I, I've been keeping some of this information and samples for a long time, and I, I can't, I don't have the time to do research anymore. Uh, so, I, I mean, they're just sitting there, and I'm, they're possibly could be used by somebody else uh, if they see the useful. Data has been collected in an access database since 1990 on all the full tests. Have been done in the last, in both Lexington and Princeton. Uh, the database is currently just from 1990 to 2012. So if you can see the time I changed my new position. It's 2012. <laughs> I, I, I was surprised. I thought I just did this a couple of years ago when I saw this. Oh, that was six years ago. I, I can update it because the data is in individual files that need to get placed into this master database. But this is a useful database if you're wanting to uh, data mine uh, school test results throughout the state. The fields are the year. The, this field is whether it's home on garden H, A is agricultural sample, C would be commercial court. Uh, the county is identified for each sample, uh, the geographic area, and you have pH and nutrients. Acres is provided if it goes in on the form and the crop to be grown is there. Uh, some other information uh, cation exchange capacity, and this is calculated cation exchange capacity for soil test results. Uh, percent base saturation, exchangeable cations, uh, uh, tillage, uh, whether it's no till or conventional till. So it, it may be useful to you. Uh, Bradley used it when he's looking at uh, urban soils and the phosphorus issue on urban soils and try to educate people on phosphorus application. Uh, so it's there uh, if you want to uh, contact me. Uh, another thing that may be of interest is soil samples that have been collected since 2000 from a soil proficiency testing program. A proficiency testing program, if you're not familiar with it, is a program where you sign up to receive samples. Some central lab sends out samples 
to the many different labs. Uh, you receive the samples, you do the analysis, and you submit the results, and then you can compare your results to everybody else's. Uh, it's completely anonymous. You don't know anybody else's lab name, but you see the results to see how well your lab is doing. Well, I've kept these samples uh, in our storeroom uh, since 2000. Uh, all the reports and results from what the laboratories got from a variety of different tests are on the website, at the NAPT website. Uh, the reports are shown each quarter. Uh, uh, five samples are sent each quarter. Uh, and then if you wanted to see what the results are, you put on soil. Uh, environmental soil. We did not participate in this, not many labs do, but you see the number of labs here. It's not great, up to seven, but this is total analysis of these chemicals uh, in these soils. I thought you might be interested in this, Jason. Uh, so it's got a lot of different metals uh, that have the median concentration that these labs analyze. Then mercury also, but, but only one lab participated this quarter on mercury. Uh, Jim Crossfield used this in some of the work he was doing with uh, phosphorus testing uh, in his method. Uh, he collected mm -hmm. some soils if he wanted to do a comparison uh, of methods or have some material. These soils are built. Uh, this is what the uh, shells look like with all the soils. Uh, this is one sample are identified by year and then the number of that year. I don't think they would be good for microbiological work, <laughs> but uh, chemical work, I think. Okay. Uh, the moving on uh, to the renovation in Princeton. This is, I'm not sure how recent this is. I was supposed to go this week, but I had to post on my trip for next week. Um, but uh, to give you an update on the soil test lab at least, and what they're planning on doing during the renovation, uh, they are plan Amanda uh, Martin, you may have known her, she was a graduate student here, she's a supervisor down there now. Uh, and they're planning on moving to a temporary location They're planning on moving to a temporary location in a couple months, uh, <coughs> not a couple months, more than that, uh, December or January, uh, and then work in that temporary location. It, it could be through the spring season, I'm not sure, depending on how quick they are in getting their lab renovated so they can move back in. Uh, plans for the renovated lab when they move back in is to uh, introduce soil organic matter as a new test for that lab. And I made a mistake on this slide, Lexington and Princeton should be switched. This is Lexington, uh, this should be Princeton. Uh, what I wanted to point out here is Lexington currently does soil organic matter. They, we do it for researchers and we do it for uh, producers to submit soil organic matter uh, as a special request. The method we currently use for soil organic matter is combustion from LECO, where we analyze carbon and convert to organic matter. The plan is in the future, when both Lexington and Princeton uh, are running organic matter, is to move to a method called loss on ignition, or LOI for short. Uh, you use a muffle furnace, you put the soil in a muffle furnace at very high temperatures, combust uh, all the organic matter, and then get the weight before and after to get a termination of organic matter. It's a more efficient method, it's uh, less costly, there's not much uh, consumable chemical costs associated with it. Well, there's none, really, because it's just weight to the material before and after. So we're planning on going to that. Uh, next, early next year. 
And it's, it's been real interesting looking at this data recently with the paper that came out, as I mentioned, from Greg Dalich on uh, pasture stockpiling and nitrogen recommendations. Uh, Jimmy asked me to, to and uh, John Bro asked me to pull together some organic matter data so it could be evaluate, evaluated what is the current range of organic matter in our soils in Kentucky. Uh, so I did that, and this is a, a result of that analysis. Uh, and, and I looked at uh, two hundred uh, samples submitted in 2017. We had 623 samples of that for organic matter. And these are all producer samples, not researchers. Uh, and this is a histogram showing the distribution of organic matter in all these ag samples. And these are all iron samples. So you see, you know, averaged about uh, two and a half to three percent. Uh, for sand organic matter pasture samples, this is the distribution for those samples. And there is a greater concentration in pasture samples, which would be expected because that soil is not disturbed. So, you know, as we all were taught and know that no till soils have a better ability to conserve their organic matter and it doesn't get burned because you're not uh, turning the soil over and breaking up uh, soil structure. I had to go back uh, a few more years to get about the same number of samples for organic matter in pasture samples and went back to 2013. Uh, this is the same data shown on one graph uh, showing the box plot distribution of the samples uh, and the data in the box is 50 percent represents 50 percent uh, percentile of the data and then the data ooh, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the data uh, oh, okay. the data uh, to the whiskers is 95 percent of the data uh, this is the average uh, organic matter with the 95 or 99% confidence interval <coughs> where the mean actually is. So you can see there is a greater concentration of organic matter in pasture soil. Uh, thinking about this last couple of days uh, about how and what to report on a producer uh, report on organic matter. I had some ideas I'd like to present here uh, for feedback. And these ideas actually were something I got from Travis's uh, seminar uh, for his interview, uh, where he presented looking at um, the distribution of results and uh, presenting to the client where they stood with respect to that distribution. Because I get calls a lot of times from extension agents asking, well, we got this percent organic matter, what is that normal? Or what is, what, where does that lie with respect to all the soils in Kentucky? You know, is it low, high, and medium? Uh, so I, I think a, a presentation like this might help address those questions. Uh, this is a bell curve. We all know bell curve. Uh, and bell curve has plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviation. And I put down here percent organic matter uh, as with, as with presented on the previous slide. So you can see that the average percent organic matter is 2.7%. And uh, plus or minus one standard deviation will be two to 3.4% and so on. Now, there is something called a z-score that in one value can give you an idea of where that particular percent organic matter lies within, with respect to that distribution. And the z-score is calculated as shown in this formula. It would be percent organic matter minus the average divided by the standard deviation. Looking at that equation, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around what exactly that tells you. But with 
figure here, you can see the Z score in green on bottom is what would be equivalent to the percent organic matter in red. If I have a percent organic matter of 2%, I would have a Z score of minus one. I would be minus one standard deviations from the if I had an organic matter that was exactly the same, it was the average on that distribution curve, on that bell curve, my z-score would be zero. So this is just an idea, and then this I think would take some education for people to get used to what the z-score actually represents. But if you had a soil test report and it would show the percent organic matter, 1.2%, and then for parentheses, z score minus 2.1. Minus 2.1 tells you that you're pretty significantly below the average of all the other uh, soils in the state <coughs> with respect to organic. You know, 1.2% is low. So it is, it's giving you an idea that it's two standard deviations below the average. 3.7%, a plus in the z-score tells you you're above you. A minus tells you you're below. It's not providing any interpretations of good, bad, or adequate. It's only telling you where that value is with respect to the distribution. Okay, more on organic matter with respect to soil health. Uh, NRCS has really pushed the last few years the soil health test. Um, I would show this idealized slide in the class in PLS 650 to describe uh, nitrogen phosphorus passing availability plants and why we could test some nutrients and not others. Um, passing is all organic. Phosphorus is approximately half inorganic and half organic. Nitrogen is 99% organic. We have chemical extractants that do a good job on predicting phosphorus and passing availability because most of those nutrients exist in the soil as inorganic solids. What we have trouble predicting is biology. We have trouble predicting how much nutrients tied up in organic matter is going to be mineralized from microbial activity. Uh, microbiology is very hard to predict. So we, we do not have any soil tests that anybody's using. There might be some long uh, term incubation test for nitrogen. We have no efficient soil test that a lab is using to predict nitrogen. Uh, there are some tests, such as the pre citrus nitrate test, that can uh, you sample soil right before cydressing nitrogen on corn. You get an idea of how much nitrogen exists at that moment in time uh, that has been mineralized uh, in the spring. So we have a difficult time predicting this organic phase, this biology. I, I think that's what the soil health test is trying to get a handle on. It, it's such a big handle to try to grasp. And there's all kinds of tests coming out to get indices of soil microbial health. Uh, these are packages that Cornell offers. Uh, there's $60. I wish I had some other help. You gotta be patient. You gotta double click it. We'll go to math. <coughs> there we go. They have a package for $60. It includes uh, soil respiration, wet aggregate stability, uh, hardness, and then another package that uh, has active carbon, autoclase and protein protein test. And these tests are expensive, $60 for one, $110 for the other. The soil respiration test, uh, 
and I, I'm pretty sure this is correct. Mark, if you correct me if I'm wrong, but soil respiration test, I believe, is the Solvita test where they take the soil, uh, build moist, add water to it, and then measure carbon dioxide uh, coming off the soil to get an idea of the microbial burst of activity from weather. So that, that Sylvania test is being offered by a lot of laboratories. And the uh, graph that's in that paper that Greg Hellich had in uh, Ag Economics uh, showed soil test biological activity versus soil organic matter. And this, I'm pretty sure this soil organic, this soil test biological activity is that carbon dioxide test. And it showed a good relationship to soil organic matter. I've heard other researchers not research that I've done myself, but other research say that all these expensive soil health tests that are being advocated, uh, they, they're having a good correlation with just soil organic matter. So it seems like just the soil organic matter is <coughs> useful to assess soil health. So, uh, you know, that's why I guess I was pushing for Princeton, both Princeton and Lexington labs, to have this organic matter test. The soil health test seems to be being pushed out there. Uh, it's an idea that I think a lot of people were resistant to because, well, first of all, it doesn't provide a definitive answer on what to do once you get the test. And it's different. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to uh, predict what to do from a biological test. But I was surprised to see this, that uh, Greg does have some guidance on what nitrogen applications on pasture based on soil organic And there's a lot of information here, but I just wanted to show that if we were offering a soil organic matter test, uh, it can be used with a table like this to help producers predict whether or not by nitrogen or how much nitrogen to apply. The more organic matter there is, and this is also based on predicted biological activity from different uh, management functions. But if you have higher organic matter, if you predict they have more nitrogen analyzed and would need to apply less nitrogen. Okay, uh, so, so organic matter is going to be offered in both labs and hopefully with research that's coming on board with soil health and the data I just showed previously, we could offer that test to help uh, farmers uh, predict uh, nitrogen recommendation. Uh, plant tissue analysis, that's also going to be added to the uh, test that Princeton performs. So we're going to do microwave digestion. <coughs> and uh, I point this out that this is a very nice publication that uh, Chad Leakey, Greg Schwab, and Bob Pierce and Bill Fong put together. A lot of nice photos about how to take samples, uh, the, where to take samples, the, the, the maturity of the plant. Uh, and it can be used in uh, sent to, to the Princeton lab and actually get analysis from the University of Kentucky lab. And there's good sufficiency range uh, tables in here. Uh, but once they get results, uh, we have a good information to interpret the results on whether the nutrient rate, the nutrient concentrations are in a, a range that's considered to be adequate for proper plant. Uh, a couple other future items that I'm only going to talk about from this one slide. Uh, we have a soils computer program in county extension offices. It's uh, really getting old. It was put in place in 2001. Uh, it's breaking with the Windows 10 operating system. Uh, there's a big push to, to get that replaced, and that's taken a lot of my time trying to get uh, that effort uh, moving. Uh, and hopefully we'll have something that's cloud-based where we don't have to worry about these different operating systems. <coughs> uh, website upgrade, I just mentioned this, that our website is being upgraded, so you'll see a new look uh, soon, hopefully. Uh, and this 
explanation of the best All right. Uh, hemp. Fifth gear is hemp. I'm going to talk about hemp. Uh, and mention that we're testing for KDA. Uh, they have inspectors going out and sampling. They're drying the hemp samples and then they send them to us for analysis. Uh, we started doing this last year. Uh, and this is part of the hemp program to make sure that the farmers growing hemp in this uh, hemp research program uh, are having samples that are less than what is allowed with respect to the THC concentration. The Farm Bill 2014 really opened the doors uh, for states legislatures to legalize hemp production and have state park or the Department of Agriculture uh, regulate hemp. Uh, in Kentucky, uh, we, we have a big push from that with our political leaders and uh, we're doing a lot of good research in the College of Ag on how best to, uh, to manage it, fertilize it. This is a graph that I thought was interesting showing the acres of hemp planted per state in 2017. I don't have the 2018 data, uh, but it shows Kentucky, North Dakota, and Oregon about second place, and Colorado is the big one there with uh, hemp and marijuana. Uh, for comparison, in the US, worldwide. Uh, U.S. acres are 25,000, and you see the acreages in the other uh, countries. So we're lagging, lagging behind. Uh, and just comparison, it is a pretty minor crop with respect to major road crops. Some pictures of hemp fields. This is uh, a fiber hemp crop. Uh, fiber. The hemp crops grow up taller, and if hemp is used to produce CBD oil, it's more of a bushy plant, and this is for CBD production. Uh, a little bit, I wanted to get into the chemistry uh, and talk about our analysis. The Farm Bill has defined industrial hemp to be any uh, material that has a delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol concentration <clears throat> less than 0.3%. And this uh, tetrahydrocannabinol is THC. This is what uh, is the psychoactive drug that gets you up. But there's confusion on what, sh what this means in the farm deal, the way it's defined. The reason is uh, there is a THC and a THCA. THCA is the molecule that is acid, the A stands for acid. So before THC is even formed, you have the precursor molecules, THCA, well, the precursor molecule, THCA. The precursor to the THCA is this molecule here, CDGA. This one molecule is worked on by a couple of enzymes. And it depends on the, the strain of the plant, but if you, in marijuana, you have this enzyme predominate. In hemp, you have this enzyme predominate to form the precursor to CBD. And you should have a minimal amount of the precursor to THC. But you have this acid form of THC. It's non psychoactive, and the acid form is this carboxyl group here that is cleaved when it is burned or heated. So when the material is smoked, you have a decarboxyl <coughs> to form THC without the carboxyl group. So you have a THCA and a THC. So if you remember that language that I showed in the Farm Bill, it says the concentration uh, needs to be less than 0.3% of delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, cannabinol, THC. 
some states are interpreting that to be just the concentration of THC and not the concentration of the precursor of THC that will become THC once it burns. So, I mean, if you're really wanting to get an idea of the total potential for that material to be psychoactive, then you need to consider both THCA and THC. So when, when you eat marijuana, is there like an enzyme in the gut that converts it or does it have to be heated? It has to be heated. Brownies are heated. No baked cheesecake is not going to work. <laughs> my dad, my dad's got a lot of pain, and he goes to the bar and people tell him, I, "I'll set you up. I'll give you some pot." Well, they gave him marijuana, but he told me, "Say, all right, I ate it. I ate it. I ate it. Nothing. Nothing." <laughs> And you just ate the plant, you know? He, he ate it without burning <laughs> it or cooking it. And not until I was reading more about this, I said, well, that's why he didn't get high, because just eating the plant. So, this, if you measure the material with HPLC, you, you can get the concentration of THCA and THC. And some states are regulating this product by looking at that concentration of THC, but not accounting for the material that can convert it to THC once it's burned. On GC analysis, because the high temperature in the input of the material before it's burned into a gas, all of that THCA is converted to THC. So you get one peak in the GC that is both THC and THCA. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion out there because this is new. States are just getting these laws and labs are just getting set up to analyze this. And, and some states were just reporting this and, and not the THCA. In Kentucky, uh, KDA is strongly enforcing that this is the correct uh, concentration to be measured the combination of THC and THCA. And I, I heard just today that the new farm bill is going to clarify that, that have the language in there, so it's not as muddled. So we're interpreting that as a total psychoactive form. Uh, KDA, the actions they take, if it's less than 0.399%, then it passes. If it's between 0.399 and 1 percent, it's resampled and harvest. Uh, harvest material is retested. If it's greater than 1 percent, then the material is burned. Okay. Uh, if you consider the THC and CCA smoked or made into cookies, I think there's going to be a difference in how much is actually delivered to the lung. With the THC smoked, there should be less compared to the total of the two. Because when you smoke cigarettes or, or marijuana cigarettes, mm -hmm. the transfer of the compound to the smoke depends on a lot of factors. For example, in cigarettes, only about 10% of the nicotine is delivered. I don't know how much is delivered to the marijuana. Maybe. And the rest is exhaled? Or well, the rest, stay, part of it stays in the, stays in the filter yeah. or in the, uh, in the part that's not smoked. I see. Where if you're consuming it. Where if you're cooking it, I mean, if you're baking it. Yeah. You're you're eating eating it. it. Yeah. So it's, <coughs> they're not exactly equal. Yeah, that's getting into a realm that I think you can test. Or some might like to. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to report nope. the stuff that's over one percent, and I guess you burn it in a fume or something? It should be testable. Uh, we return it to KDA. Is that the smoke oh, okay. Yeah, we return everything to KDA. That's not the person. They close it. 
Uh, this is a histogram of concentration we find. And we find they don't send us everything. They send us samples that are suspect, mostly varieties are suspect. And 12% were greater than in this 0.399%. We, yeah, we had some high values. But you know, I've learned that marijuana now really has high THD at 1%. There, there are some that saying we should go to 1% of the cutoff. But marijuana is like 15, 25 Okay, I'm kind of running out of time here. Uh, KDA labels each as variety concern, the prohibited variety that are greater. Uh, about 80% of the hemp that is grown uh, really is grown for CBD. They can't claim it as a medical benefit or a drug, but it is still produced and claimed as a, I don't exactly know the words they use, but I think I'd be careful because it's not. It's not uh, accepted as a drug by FDA. Uh, but they, they, it is growing for CBD. Uh, you see CBD oils, uh, the companies advocating that it should it be, could be taken to alleviate pain and uh, whatnot. This is just a uh, histogram showing the ratio of CBD over THC. Uh, a lot of samples we collect are for CBD production because the concentration of this ratio is high. And these are mostly hemp samples. But we, we do analyze CBD in addition to THC. We only report THC to KDA. Uh, but we have a database with CBD that may be useful for researchers. So KDA indicated that they can make this available. Uh, we have the variety uh, of THC, CBD, and the, the ratio of CBD to THC. Uh, because of the newness of uh, labs analyzing hemp uh, to, to regulate the product, uh, there, there's a lot of variability throughout the state, uh, throughout the country uh, on analysis of THC. And we are uh, going to initiate a uh, proficiency testing program for hemp. Uh, the reason I personally thought it was so important is when we try to get this going in our lab last year. We had such a difficult time trying to match our results with the Kentucky Tobacco Research Development Center who did it the previous year. Uh, we weren't getting exactly the results they were. Uh, and we banged our head against the wall, you know, making sure everything was the same that they were doing. Uh, but we, okay, decided to send it to another lab. We sent it to Colorado. You think Colorado showed you the acres that they're growing would be uh, a good comparison lab. Well, they introduced even more confusion on where we stood with respect to the right answer. Colorado lab uh, was even less than ours, the RS Division Regulatory Services. So that really, to me, showed a need to, to assess the variability of all the labs with respect to THC analysis. Uh, and we're, uh, we have a proficiency program that's going to start this fall. This is a brochure that was prepared, this advertised program. Uh, 34 labs have signed up in the U.S. to be in the program. 18 are public labs, 12 private, and four Kentucky labs. Uh, two samples will be sent in September and two in October. Uh, the results will be submitted and analyzed in comparison uh, statistical analysis of the goals of this program are to assess inter and intra laboratory variability. The labs will be asked to submit uh, a replicated analysis um, of the samples. So we'll get an intra lab variability uh, handle. Uh, it's also a goal to evaluate what the allowed variance should be for these states in looking at this. If you have one hard number that you could say is half or not, you have to allow for some variability. Which Kentucky does by saying 0.399 percent instead of 0.3, but they do that just based on the number pulled out of the air, <laughs> not based on any hard uh, analysis of variance. Uh, and also the standardized methodology. Uh, once we get a handle of what everybody is doing, we come up with a standard method and hopefully uh, narrow the variability. 
So I thank you and I uh, would like to address any questions you might have. So the regulation, it just says, it doesn't say like what part of the plan. So I guess one has to assume it's the whole plan. Yes, yes, but I noticed yes. in your database, some of the samples were flowers, whole plants. You can state your sample in different parts of plants too. That's another aspect that needs to be standardized. <laughs> some plants analyze seeds, some don't. They analyze seeds. Uh, in Kentucky, they sample the top eight inches. At what stage? Uh, pre harvest, right before harvest, like a week or two. Right, right at Princeton. They have the best report we need to say at Princeton. Any questions for Princeton? We have one in the back. Yeah, I'm quite interested in uh, soil programs, computer programs. Uh, I just wonder how do they predict the soils in future in Kentucky? Um, they, what kind of factors they consider influence the future changes in soil organic pattern in different ecosystems, including carbon, pasture, wetland? I mean, that's. Well, I have an easy answer to that. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I understood what you How do we predict the future? Uh, changes in carbon in, in soils. And we, we don't do that traditionally. So what will we do by using, you know, the soil computer program? What we do for that? What? I saw you have, you know, the website up, up page. Oh, the soil computer yeah, program. Soil. Mm -hmm. uh, in, did, did I mention that it's in each county office? Oh, yes. Yeah. Is that, is that yeah, the program? Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a program that where it, when the county uh, extension office receives a sample mm -hmm. from a client, they enter the crop that's going to be grown. They they submit that that gets emailed to oh. the central database, and then once mm -hmm. we and they send a sample to us. Once we okay. analyze the sample, we email them the results. Okay. It gets it gets put into that program, and then it generates a report. So. It's Not just, for future projections. No. no oh, I saw you. You see, so your see future that? changes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Yeah. I, that slide says, "Oh, the future change." Yeah, yeah. I can see where that. Is. <laughs> oh, the future change is to get that program updated. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I thought that. I'm understanding the question. Okay, so on that slide, I'm saying. That's good. Let's see, Chris. Did you have something? Yeah, just regarding that soil organic matter nitrogen thing, Frank. Uh, right now, in APR one, it talks about drainage class and tillage as well. So just try to have general ranges of recommendations. If you go this route with soil organic matter, you see yourself trying to mesh that uh, drainage, soil organic matter, nitrogen. You know, I, I think I would make rely a lot on others that are out there actually. You know, to get advice from the APR one committee. On, on what to do with that. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't see myself actually making a suggested interpretation because I have limited uh, experience with, with what's actually occurring out there in the field. I, I, I see myself as uh, providing the test results yeah. and relying on experts. Um, Last question, Todd. So, well, my thought on your Z score would be I would, you know, getting something that I wouldn't know much about. I would prefer if it just said, your sample is higher than 70% of the samples in Kentucky, which range from zero to eight or something like that. So, you already have a Z score, you can look on your on your distribution as to what percentile it is. I would understand that more readily than a Z score. Yeah, I, I like like SAT scores of my my son got or something. It 
it gives it a, a sense of where you actually lie. I, I thought of that, but that's like a lot of work. <laughs> I thought, you know, it was short and sweet to say Z score plus 2.3, but I understand that if you don't know 